Welcome to this lecture on the vascular side of the cardiovascular system. Now for full disclosure, I'm outside in the wilderness, um, and so that's going to lead to two issues, one of which is that there are bugs. I am sorry about that. The other thing is that there's quite a bit of wind, and the wind is getting picked up by the um, audio. So when you hear it, you'll obviously know. But the only al other alternative I had was to do it inside, and when I did it inside, the uh, place where I'm filming is cavernous, and so it echoed everywhere, and I was afraid that the audio would be so garbled and screechy that I made the executive decision to do it outside. So here I am sitting on a concrete pad um, filming this lecture. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So this is going to cover the vascular side of the cardiovascular system. And so we are going to be looking at blood vessels and how blood flows through those vessels. So first, we're going to introduce the names of those blood vessels, like arteries and veins and that kind of thing. Then we're going to take a look at the anatomical wrappings of those blood vessels and look at their function. So we'll emphasize the smooth muscle wrapping and the elastic tissue wrapping where it exists. Finally, we'll take a look at blood pressure, what it is, what generates it, and how it changes as you move around a systemic circuit. And then we'll take a look at arterioles. Now, the second part of this lecture is going to pick up with capillaries. So we'll look at structure function relationship of capillaries, and we'll look at how capillaries exchange materials between blood and the interstitial fluid. And then we'll take a look at some interesting features associated with veins. And then we'll look at some odds and ends like atherosclerosis and myocardial infarction. All right, let's get started. So we name blood vessels by their approximate position relative to the ventricles. So a blood vessel that is taking blood away from the ventricle is known as an artery. And the closer you are to the heart, the larger diameter you're probably going to be. So the largest arteries are the ones that are closest to the heart. As those arteries move away from the heart and they branch off into smaller and smaller arteries, the arteries decrease in diameter. And they keep decreasing and keep decreasing until you get to a really, really, really small artery that is no longer called an artery, but rather an arteriole. So arterioles are defined as being like tiny little arteries, um, but they are one one hundredth of the diameter of the biggest arteries. The arterioles are going to bring blood into the capillaries. Interestingly enough, when people talk about blood vessels, they tend to focus on arteries and veins, but capillaries are actually where it's at. And what I mean by that is capillaries are going to be where all the exciting stuff happens. In fact, if you want the appropriate lens to look at the cardiovascular system, you should really start with the capillaries because capillaries are gonna be where all the exchange between the plasma and the interstitial fluid happen. What exchange? Oxygen, CO2, nutrients, waste products, water, heat, etc. Everything else is just about getting blood to the capillaries and back to the heart again. Really, including the heart. So we spend all this time looking at the heart and very little time looking at really what the major end game is, which is to bring blood to the capillaries and pull blood back from the capillaries to go back to the heart, where it can generate more pressure. So as blood leaves the capillaries, they enter uh, larger blood vessels called venules, and then those venules eventually funnel into even larger blood vessels <clears throat> known as veins. When we take a look at the anatomical wrappings of these different blood vessels, Note that all blood vessels contain what is known as an endothelial lining. An endothelial lining is going to be a layer of simple squamous cells that are going to be wrapped in a cylindrical fashion. It is always the innermost lining of any blood vessel. In some cases, it is the only lining, as you can see here with the capillaries. Now, notice that the arteries and the veins have more wrappings around them, including smooth muscle, and the larger uh, arteries also have elastic tissue. One of the other features that you might notice here is that the veins contain what are called one-way valves. Now, one-way valves are going to be a lot like semilunar valves, meaning that they uh, direct one-way flow of blood. They are anatomically designed like this 
so that when blood squirts up from underneath, it pushes the valves open, but when blood tries to come back down, it catches the valves and pushes them shut. In that way, blood only moves this direction and not that direction, hence the term one-way valve versus a two-way valve. Okay, so let's take a look at the smooth muscle. So smooth muscle is found around the arteries, the arterioles, and the veins. So what's the end game of that smooth muscle? Well, the end game for the arteries and the arterioles is to direct the flow of blood. Now I'm gonna to get to that in a little bit. The end game for the veins is a little bit different. Veins do not get to pick and choose which way blood moves. It doesn't say, no, I want blood to go this way instead of that way, like arteries and arterioles do. So why have smooth muscle around veins? Well, it turns out that veins actually contain a lot of blood and they're pretty big, big vessels. In fact, usually bigger than arteries. So if you constrict the smooth muscle around the vein, you tighten up those blood vessels and therefore it's used as a compensation mechanism to adjust for low blood volume or low blood pressure. So the purpose of smooth muscle around the veins is more of a compensation mechanism rather than having a purpose like directing blood flow. So the purpose of smooth muscle varies depending on which type of vessel that smooth muscle is around. So now it's time to introduce two terms, vasoconstriction and vasodilation. Vasoconstriction is the term used to describe the smooth muscle that is constricting around a blood vessel. When the smooth muscle constricts, it tightens up that diameter or reduces that diameter and therefore would increase the resistance of that tube and decrease the flow through that tube. The opposite is called vasodilation. Vasodilation occurs when the smooth muscle around a blood vessel relaxes, and when it relaxes, the diameter expands, the resistance drops, and therefore more blood flows through that tube. This is exemplified in this image here. In the top image, we have one large blood vessel that splits into four equidiameter blood vessels, and you can see that the fluid flow through each one is equal. In other words, you take a certain amount of fluid and you say one quarter goes to the top one, one quarter goes to the next one, one quarter and one quarter. Whereas the bottom picture here, you can see that that second vessel has vasoconstricted. Because it is vasoconstricted, the diameter decreases. That increases the resistance and therefore reduces the amount of blood that will flow through that particular vessel. So now what we're going to do is take a look at smooth muscle and its role around arteries specifically. Now smooth muscle around the arteries controls the overall flow of blood to different organs. So this is oxygen rich blood coming from the left ventricle. Now it turns out that there's kind of a default amount of blood that goes to each organ, especially at rest. And you can see that here. Sometimes this is assessed as amount of blood per minute, like liters per minute. I like to look at what's called percentages, like what percent of the blood is going into these various areas. And so we can see that the kidneys actually get a lot, 20%. The brain gets around 15, the um, digestive system gets a little over 25, skeletal muscles get around 20% as well. So these percentages are dictated by the diameter of the arteries that are leading to those different organs. So in order to get a lot of blood to go to your digestive system, you need to have big arteries where other arteries need to be much smaller, and that will direct more of the blood to the digestive system. But the fact that the smooth muscle can be constricted or relaxed tells you that the diameter of those service arteries can change. And if you can change the, the diameter, you can change the percentage of blood that goes to that particular organ. So I happen to love this diagram because I think it really um, demonstrates that principle very well. The left bar is showing how much blood each organ system gets at rest. And it's done at cardiac output. 
So at rest, a typical cardiac output is going to be 5 liters per minute or 5,000 milliliters per minute. And then it shows you the breakdown. How much does the heart get? How much does the brain get? Look, the kidneys get lots. The digestive system gets lots. And the skeletal muscle, not as much. So it gives you how many milliliters per minute, but then it also gives you what percentage that is. So during exercise, the cardiac output increases substantially. And this is actually going to be demonstrated in lab 14. But it's shown here as well. So you can see that that bar gets a lot bigger, showing a lot more blood is cycled through the heart per minute. So now you can see the flow per minute here. Like, look at the digestive system while you're exercising. At rest, it's 1350 mils per minute, but during exercise, it's 600 mils per minute. In other words, you're going to be vasoconstricting the arteries that lead to the small intestine, the large intestine, the liver, the pancreas, etc. Whereas you're going to be vasodilating the arteries that lead to your skeletal muscles that are going to take a lot more of this blood. So you can see how the cardiac output and where the blood is going to be distributed changes depending on the body's needs. So now we get to the question of who's controlling the smooth muscle around the arteries? Well, it depends. But in general, arteries and veins are controlled by the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. Whereas arterioles, which also have smooth muscle, uh, are less controlled by neurons and more controlled by local feedback. But this is showing here, again, this is showing an arterial, but this is showing the idea that when the smooth muscle is relaxed, the arter arterial dilates. When it's constricted, the diameter constricts as well. Okay, so the sympathetic nervous system has norepinephrine as its dominant neurotransmitter. And I just wanted to show you this real quick to show that a neuron is controlling the smooth muscle around the arteries. And neurons control the smooth muscle around the veins too. So let's quickly follow some logic. When you are exercising, your sympathetic nervous system is in control. So we know that one of the big changes to cardiac output is we're going to divert a whole lot more blood to the skeletal muscle, and we're going to divert a whole lot less blood to the digestive system. So that means that the sympathetic nervous system is going to actually do two different things. To the digestive system, it's going to cause vasoconstriction. To the skeletal muscles, it's going to cause vasodilation of those arteries. So here's the same system, but causing two different things, depending on the organs that those arteries serve. So we've now finished our discussion of smooth muscle around the arteries. I'm going to shift gears for a moment and talk about blood pressure. Okay, so now we're going to look at blood pressure. So blood pressure is effectively a measurement of how much the fluid is pushing against the walls. Now, one thing that can affect blood pressure is the volume of fluid that's crammed into that space. And so I'm going to use an imperfect demonstration here, but that is of water balloons filled with different amounts of fluid. So I'm going to have a pretty small balloon, a medium-sized balloon, and a larger water balloon. And I put a little piece of tape over part of that water balloon, and then I'm going to poke a hole into each one. Now, the one that is under the most pressure is going to be the one that is filled with the most fluid. So I predict that the one that is filled with the most fluid and therefore is under the most pressure is going to have the biggest stream of water coming out, which would indicate that it's under the most pressure. So let's go ahead and watch. So this is the smallest one. And you can see a little bit of strain there, but not a lot. This is medium. A little harder to see there, but you can see it's coming forward. And this is the largest one. Oh, big strain, as evidenced by the fact that it hit the camera. And it's still going. You can see the one that was under more pressure is continually uh, squirting out more fluid. Now, my other son uh, decided he wanted to, to participate in the reindeer game, so he brought me a balloon to poke, but it has no tape. I knew that was going to happen, but I did it anyway. 
Okay, so in that demonstration, we see that the more fluid we try to push into a container, the more pressure it's going to be under. So this was not demonstrated, but imagine if the uh, child that is on the far right, who had the biggest balloon, started squeezing the balloon after there was a hole already poked. What would happen to the water? Well, we would expect that the water would come out with even more force because he's putting more pressure on it. So what is he doing really? He's reducing the volume of the container that is holding the water. In other words, if he took that amount of water and put it in a giant balloon like this, it wouldn't be under any pressure at all. But by making the diameter of that balloon small, and even smaller by trying to squeeze it with his hand, he exerts more force. So this is going to lead into our next topic. Blood pressure is generated by the heart. So the heart is the big pressure generator, specifically the ventricles. And because the left ventricle generates so much more pressure than the right ventricle, that tends to be where we put our emphasis. Now, when the left ventricle goes through systole, it exerts a lot of force and that ejects blood out into the arteries. Now, the semilunar valves are forced open, that blood comes through, and you can see in this image here that the force or pressure of that fluid doesn't just push the um, blood straight forward, but also pushes against the artery wall. So it doesn't just push the blood this way, it pushes this way too. And there is elastic around that artery wall. So the elastic is going to allow for the expansion of the artery wall. Now, when the semilunar valve shut, the elastic recoils, shrinks the volume, and therefore keeps the blood pressure up. So this is analogous to squeezing the water balloon after it's already got a hole poked into it. So when that elastic recoils, what that does actually is helps push the blood forward even when the ventricle is not working. So the ventricle gives all of the push, but part of that push is captured in the expansion of the elastic. And so when the elastic recoils, because the semilunar valve is shut right here, as you can see, the semilunar valve is shut, that blood can only go one way. So the elastic tissue helps move blood even when the heart is not working. So it's just kind of a delayed help. So some of the energy from the ventricle contraction is actually captured by the elastic expansion. And then when that elastic recoils, it helps move the blood forward, even when the heart is in diastole. Okay, so this also explains this funky graph. So I'd like you to look at it for about a minute. Go ahead and pause the video if you need to. There's a lot of interesting things going on in this graph. This graph shows how blood pressure changes through the systemic circuit. So you might notice that the pressure in the ventricle changes drastically, right? So big up, big down, big up, to big down, almost to zero. So that's going to represent systole, diastole, systole, diastole. And again, after systole, the ventricle only has a little bit of blood left and then it relaxes so the volume expands. I can get it to land on me. Oh, that would have been cool. Okay, so the ventricle um, contracts, pushes blood out. There's still a little bit of blood left, but now the ventricle relaxes, the walls expand, and again, it's like filling a little bit of fluid in a giant balloon. There's just no pressure. Yet the pressure in the arteries, which initially matches that of the ventricle, stays high, even when the ventricle uh, is relaxed. And again, it stays high because of the elastic recoil, by recoiling that elastic around the blood, it reduces the diameter and therefore keeps the pressure high. So again, that elastic recoil is part of what keeps the pressure high, even during ventricular uh, diastole. Now, if we come back here, I wanna point out that the arterioles show the biggest general drop off in pressure. And the reason why is because the arterial diameter is so much smaller than the artery diameter. So we're going from big vessels to comparatively much smaller vessels. And when that happens, we encounter a lot more resistance. And as we encounter more resistance, it's kind of like pushing a shopping cart 
over a really bumpy asphalt. I mean, the shopping cart just loses steam really fast. But if it's over like freshly paved asphalt, then you give it a little push and that shopping cart can fly. So it's the same idea here where you have a lot of resistance and the blood just loses its oomph as it goes down and it really never recovers. So blood pressure is actually going to be lowest in the veins, highest in the arteries, but we see the biggest drop off in the arterioles. Okay, so that's our look at blood pressure. Blood pressure is gonna be covered in more detail in lab 14. Now let's take a look at the arterioles. So the arterioles are going to control access to the capillary bed, so that's its major function. Recall that arterioles also have smooth muscle around them, and they even have special muscularized rings called sphincters that can really dictate whether or not blood goes into this capillary or that capillary. So unlike arteries and veins, which are more controlled by the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, arterioles tend to be controlled more by a local condition. You might have an arterial that's leading to just the capillaries that service this little area of skin. And if they sense, for instance, that it's really cold out there and you're trying to conserve warmth, they will respond to that temperature difference and constrict to say, mm, no blood there. In fact, that's what leads to frostbite on a grand scale. You lose too much heat through your extremities, the arterial sense the frozen condition and they just completely constrict and never let up. And when that happens, you don't get enough blood to that capillary bed and the tissue dies as a response. So here's a picture showing that smooth muscle and those sphincters um, that are serving various capillaries. So it's probably better exemplified in this image here, showing the sphincters when they're relaxed, allow blood to go into that capillary. When it's constricted, the blood is stopped. So unlike arteries, which are only going to change their diameter from like this to this, the sphincters can completely shut off the blood flow to a capillary. But it doesn't usually do that for very long. Rather, it'll be like, give blood to that little capillary bed, stop, now give a little bit more, now stop. I mean, in other words, within a second, you may get various opening and closings of that sphincter muscle. And again, it's based on local control. What control? It's measuring temperature, it's measuring oxygen levels of the surrounding area. So it's basically getting information from the nearby cells saying, do you have enough? Do you need more? Are we at risk of losing too much heat here? And making the decision about whether to open or close. So to summarize, arterioles are going to control the flow of blood into the capillaries. And this is done again by smooth muscle, but to a more extreme degree than what we saw for arteries. That is, the smooth muscle can completely constrict and totally shut off the flow of blood to a particular capillary bed. However, when that happens, it usually doesn't happen for a prolonged period of time. Also, the smooth muscle in arterioles tends to be controlled locally rather than by the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. So with that, we're going to end and we'll pick up looking at capillaries in the next part of this lecture.